Hey guys, if you're looking to get into top-down unboxing or keyboard testing videos but are not sure where to start, I'm here to help. In this video, I'll be covering a few tips such as camera angles, microphone recording and placement, video and audio monitoring, lighting, and voiceovers. I will also share a few tips that I normally take in Premiere Pro to spruce up my overall video. My goal is to get you started on a few ideas, and my equipment preferences are merely that. You are free to explore these ideas and come up with what works best for you. For my camera, I use a Panasonic GH5 Mark II, which allows me to shoot in 4K 60p. The 60 frames per second allows for me to slow down my footage for smoother B-roll shots. And this camera also has wireless monitoring to its native app and is overall much more affordable for the specs in comparison to other DSLRs on the market. For the lens, I usually shoot with my 12mm wide-angle lens so that I can capture more of my desk space when I need to. For all sound recording, including keyboard sound tests and voiceovers, I use a Shure MV7, a dynamic microphone with both USB and XLR outputs. I typically connect to my computer via USB and to my camera via XLR. I also equip this microphone with this thick foam that almost completely eliminates plosives during my voiceovers. Here's a sound test to show you the difference between having the foam on and having the foam off. Here's with the foam on. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked. And here's with the foam off. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked. So if you're doing voiceovers, make sure to grab this thicker foam screen or a pop filter to manage your plosives. Most DSLRs do not have an XLR input, which means you would need an external recorder if you're trying to use an XLR microphone to record your audio. Thankfully, Panasonic made this adapter here called the DMW-XLR1, which is an adapter that connects directly onto the hot shoe and integrates the audio with the video recording. It also comes with manual gain knobs and phantom power, which is a must for me since I use the Fedhead preamp to bump up my microphone gain without adding extra noise. And this is the Fed Head. The Fed Head is a tiny inline microphone preamp. It boosts the signal from low output dynamic microphones, reducing the noise and improving sound quality before it reaches your audio interface or mixer. It's also very easy to use and is definitely a must if you're using a dynamic microphone. Here's a quick clip on how to connect the Fed Head. Remember that the Fed Head requires phantom power and will not work if your audio interface does not supply phantom power. Connect the microphone on one end and the fat head on the other. At this point, you can plug it directly into your audio interface like I am doing here, or you can connect it to another XLR cable, which would then go into the interface. This is what most folks would do. With the microphone connected, you'll now want to monitor the audio levels to ensure that the audio pickup is not too loud and not too low. I usually look at my audio meter to check for a range of around negative 18 to negative 24 decibels for keyboard sounds and around negative 12 to negative 16 for voiceovers. The reason why I record at a lower decibel is because it is much easier to fix quiet to audio than it is to fix audio that may be blown out from a high gain. If you don't want to use an XLR microphone because of cost or complexity, shotgun mics are good alternatives. This one has a super cardioid polar pattern that picks up sound from the front while reducing side and background noise, and is good for capturing clear audio in a noisy environment, or for focusing on a single sound source. The DD Shotgun microphone also has a gain knob and a low cut filter. It won't sound as open and crisp as the Shure MV7, but it's great for you if you're recording on the move or shooting B-rolls where sound is needed. Now let's get into microphone placement. My favorite setup is to have the microphone on a stand behind my product desk, pointing at my keyboard at a 45 degree angle. I keep the microphone close enough so that it doesn't require much gain to pick up the sounds, but far enough so that it doesn't pick up any thumping of my desk as I type. I also make sure that my stand does not touch my desk, as vibrations from the desk can be picked up by your microphone and will ruin your keyboard sound. Another setup that I currently use is at my editing station, where I record my voiceovers and keyboard footage. For this setup, I use a boom arm that is clamped down to another desk so that my microphone does not pick up on any vibrations from the desk that I am using for my keyboard sounds. If you don't keep your mic separate from the vibrations, you're going to get a terrible sound recording. With this setup, I can easily swivel the mic around for my voiceovers or point it straight down over my keyboard for any sound testing. Now, let's talk about camera placement. 
For top down shots, I use an overhead bracket that sits directly on my desk and allows for me to mount my DSLR at a decent distance from the desk. To mount your DSLR, I highly recommend grabbing a decent ball head mount with a quick release feature. The ball head allows for you to adjust and lock your camera angle quickly in any direction and the quick release feature lets you easily detach your camera for handheld shots or alternate angles. Since I change angles often, having a quick release is a must for me. You also want to make sure that your ball head has 360 degrees panoramic rotation. This lets you do slow panning b-roll shots like this. When I record, I use a second monitor or my iPad to live monitor my video footage. This saves me from having to constantly look at my camera while I'm filming, which is usually going to be facing away from me. This also means that I can make sure I am in focus, because there's nothing worse than spending hours of your time recording only to have to reshoot the entire thing because maybe your products or your subject was out of focus. For side angle shots, I use a different mount that clamps to the edge of my desk. As a reminder, if your camera is clamped to a part of your desk, be gentle with whatever you're doing as your camera will shake if you're throwing things around and will potentially ruin your footage. For lighting, I use an Ameren 100X on top of a heavy duty C-Stand. These damn lights and dome are heavy, so using a C-Stand is almost a must. I weigh down the stand with a water bag that comes with the C-Stand. This helps ensure that the C-Stand does not topple over whenever I'm moving the lights around. And this is a 33.5 inch light dome that diffuses the Ameren's light, resulting in a softer and more natural looking lighting. The larger the dome, the better the light diffusion. For desk lighting, I have a few options. The first is a small LED panel that I can clamp onto my overhead mount to highlight my product. This LED panel is only by color, so it's more of a portable option in a pinch. The second is an RGB panel that I use to accentuate my frames or to highlight a product piece. Since this one has RGB options, it is definitely more versatile than the first. You can sit it in frame or outside of frame or behind another object to accentuate your footage. Next is this large LED panel that I use as side lighting. You can quickly adjust the brightness and temperature with the dials and mount it in a corner for when you need some decent lighting. Try experimenting with the lighting at different angles to see how your footage will look. Now this one is my favorite. It's an RGB wand that's lengthy enough to accentuate my entire frame and I use this one the most to highlight my product and add a bit of pop at the edge of my videos. Now, if you're looking for a budget option, I picked up this RGB bar from 5 Below for 5 bucks, and it does the job just as good. Obviously, the wire component makes it more of a hassle to manage, and you can't turn it on without the remote, but it'll do in a pinch. And that's it for my desktop lighting options. Let's go ahead and jump into Premiere Pro. First of all, I usually shoot my footage in RAW, as it allows me the most control over my video footage in post-production. Raw footage captures all of the data from the camera sensor without any in-camera processing, so your footage retains more details in the shadows and highlights. This means that you can significantly adjust exposure, white balance, and colors without degrading your footage. If you're shooting in RAW, you'll want to color grade your footage. Here are two ways to do that. First, look for Lumetri Color in the Effects panel. Drag it onto your clip. This will populate the options under Effect Controls. From here, you can make basic adjustments for exposure, contrast, white balance, and enhanced colors in the HSL Secondary tab. All that I usually do is apply a LUT and let Premiere Pro make an auto adjustment for me. The other method is to go to the color tab at the top right. From here, you'll find the Lumetri color controls in the panel on the right with all of the same options. We'll go ahead and apply the LUT and the auto adjustment. And there you have it. Here's how that image looks before and after a color grade. 
If you're going to be shooting top down footages, you'll most likely be shooting upside down, which means you'll have to rotate your clip in post. The easiest way to do this is to select the clip, go over to effect controls and set your rotation to 180 to right side up your clip. Here's what I do to fine tune my audio recording and voiceovers in Premiere Pro. I normally use A1 as my keyboard sound test track and A2 as my voiceover track. I will apply my desired effects to the entire track so that I don't have to worry about reapplying these same effects to every clip individually. To prepare the tracks, I go to the audio track mixer. You can find this panel under the window dropdown. You can also go to the audio tab to find the panel there as well. First, click on this little obscure arrow to open up the effects mixer. For my keyboard sound test track, or audio one, I add the denoise effect to eliminate any floor noise. Double click on the denoise to bring up its editor. Click on the drop down and choose light noise reduction. Too much noise reduction will distort your keyboard sounds, so I usually choose the light noise reduction option. The default works just fine, in my opinion, but I find that light works best for me as I want the sounds that come out of my keyboard to be as accurate as possible. After this, I right click on my audio track in the timeline and normalize the max peaks to negative nine decibels. I found this to be the most comfortable audio setting for my keyboard sounds. This is what the track sounds like before and after denoise. Now for my voiceover track or audio 2, I add three things, denoise, parametric equalizer, and single band compressor. I set the denoise to light reduction to minimize background noise. Now double click on the parametric equalizer and select vocal enhancer from the dropdown. This preset boosts the mid and high frequencies, giving your voice more clarity and presence. It also cuts down on low frequencies to make your voice sound cleaner and more defined. Next is the voiceover preset in the single band compressor. This effect reduces the dynamic range of your audio by lowering the volume of the high parts and boosting the quieter parts to make your voice more balanced and consistent. This is how my voice sounds without any presets. Please remember to like and subscribe. This is how my voice sounds with the presets in Premiere Pro. Don't forget to share and comment. Lastly, I use Envato Elements for all of my background music, special effects, and animated texts and logos. Instead of having to add a bunch of credits in my description, I simply browse for the songs that I want and download it for my videos. I think I'll start my video with this one. Once I have my songs downloaded, I simply drag it into my project folder and then onto the timeline. And there you go. I use Envato Elements for animated text, titles, logos, stock footage, whatever you can think of for content creation. Animating text and transitions take a lot of time and I still have a day job. So I use Envato for these assets because I just simply don't have the time. So if you're interested, check out the links in my description below. So that's about it guys. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask in the comments down below. This video took me a whole lot of time to make and I know my screen capture could have been better, but that's still kind of new to me. Anyways, leave a like.